Welcome to the last day of KubeCon. Do you guys have a good time so far? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's get started. In this uh, session, we will cover a new and innovative way to use eBPF to efficiently enforce network policies for host processes using eBPF. Uh, before we start, a bit about myself. Uh, I'm, my name is Vinay Kulkarni, and I work for eBay Cloud, where I'm helping build uh, the network segmentation, identity-based network segmentation for eBay. The agenda for today is uh, we start with an overview of what network namespaces are and understand the difference between host processes and processes that are running in Kubernetes pods. Uh, we will then cover our use case of efficiently securing host network process communication that motivated this project and look at how host processes are secured today. Uh, in order to set, uh, to show what's new in this talk, we need to set some background and context. For that, uh, I will briefly look, uh, we'll briefly look at the structure of Cilium identities and Cilium network policies and see how Cilium uses BPF to enforce network policies for regular Kubernetes pod traffic. Uh, we then look at how we may assign identities to host processes. Uh, then we wave that eBPF magic wand and identify, uh, in order to identify host processes inside the kernel in the network traffic data path. Then uh, I will show you a demo of this feature, and after that I will touch upon eBay's Trust Fabric solution, which we currently use for securing network traffic in our defense in depth strategy. And then I will open up the floor for questions. Most of you may be familiar with uh, Kubernetes namespaces. Uh, they provide us with a way to isolate cluster resources and divide it amongst users. Similarly, network namespaces provide us with a way to isolate and share the kernel network stack amongst multiple applications that are running on the node. On the very left here, you can see it's a blue box. It's a host process, a regular host process. It gets to use the local host and the each zero the IP addresses and the routing firewall rules that are there available to the host network namespace. To the right of that, you have this pod one with a single container in it. It gets its own interfaces, IP addresses, routing rules, et cetera, which is isolated from the host. And pod two here has two containers. They get to share their own local host and E0 interface and the IP addresses and routing rules, but isolated from pod one and from the host. So. In that sense, to summarize, the key difference between host processes and Kubernetes pod processes is that all host processes share the network interfaces, IP addresses, uh, et cetera, in the root or the host network namespace, and all containerized processes within a Kubernetes pod get their own set, their own copy of interfaces, IP, address and, uh, IP addresses, and routing rules that is not shared with any other namespace. In that sense, uh, this means that each Kubernetes pod acts like its own virtual machine as far as the networking behavior is concerned. The consequences of this are that pod to host communication happens via the E0 interface in the pod, and pod to pod communication typically transits the root, net, root network namespace. And the pod to external communication transits the E0 interface in the root namespace. Now, uh, let's look at our use case. Consider this scenario. You have two nodes, a master node that runs the Kubernetes API server, the scheduler, and a worker node, that node one, that runs kubelet, which listens on TCP port 10250. Now, the API server talks to kubelet on this port 10250 in order to perform tasks such as exec into a container or get the container logs. This is a legitimate and expected communication pattern between the API server and the kubelet. Now let's ring in the scheduler. The scheduler is not expected to talk to the kubelet directly at least, but let's say there is a vulnerability in the scheduler that allows a hacker to take control of that and impersonate the API server. This hacker now has access to the customer workloads. Any request from the scheduler to the kubelet should be denied, but the kubelet cannot distinguish between traffic coming from the API server versus scheduler impersonating the API server because they have the same source IP and stolen credentials. So we need another layer of security here. How are host processes secured today? Well, 
it is established, it is accomplished at layer seven through cryptographic mechanisms using transport layer security or TLS. Identities are established by using certificates and communication is secured by establishing a shared secret key or a session key to authenticate and encrypt data, data that's transmitted between them. Now, layer seven security is sufficient, so then what's the catch? Well, cryptographic functions are not cheap. There is computational overhead of encryption and decryption, there is the increased latency, and then there is increased bandwidth needs. This kind of makes it an easy target for DOS attacks. The defense in depth strategy is to have an additional layer of security, or as many layers of security that's feasible. Uh, in this case, we're looking at having another layer of security that drops malicious traffic early. That is what eBPF brings to the table. Now let's look at how Cilium efficiently secures Kubernetes pod traffic. What Cilium does is it attaches eBPF programs to the pod network interfaces as well as the host network interface. The long story short, these BPF programs perform sender identification and policy enforcement. The BPF programs that handle traffic egressing the pod insert the sender identity into the encapsulation headers that we use. The BPF programs at the ingress, they look up the policy for the incoming sender and determine whether the traffic should be allowed or denied. denied. That is enforcement of the policy. In this example, we have the bank teller pod tagged with the teller identity for traffic going out, and the BPF programs at the ingress, which is the bank database pod, checks to see if this is allowed and then enforces that policy. In this case, it lets it through. The same BPF programs would deny traffic that's coming from the bank camera pod or any other source that's not allowed by policy. The drop here happens at the lowest layers of the network stack well before any comp computational overhead of cryptographic mechanisms is incurred. Now, we talked about encapsulation. What's the story on the wire? Well, uh, when pods communicate in our scenario we, we, where we are using uh, Jenny encapsulation headers, or if you choose to use v VXLAN, uh, the BPF programs on the sender side stores the identity of the sender in this VNI field or the virtual network identifier field. It's a 24-bit field. This also means that there is a 24-bit constraint on the value of the identity. What we need is also a way to express the policy. And how is this policy expressed? Cilium offers a custom resource named Cilium Network Policy that allows us to specify the policy, network policy for our traffic. In this example, we have two pods. We have the bank teller pod with label role equals teller, and we have the bank database pod, bank DB pod, with label role equals database. Now, a Cilium network policy that only allows the teller to access the database is shown here. What it says is that allow, apply this policy to pods with label role equals database, which would be the bank DB pod, and allow traffic, the action that you need to take is allow incoming traffic from pods with, with label role equals teller, which would be this pod here, the bank teller pod. You're hearing the word labels a lot. As you might guess, they play a key role here. Now here is another example. Let's say we have a bank auditor pod. It needs access to all database pods in all namespaces. Such a policy is expressed using a cluster-wide network policy that applies to pods with label role equals database. In this case, it says apply this to all database pod, all pods with label role equals database, and the action to take is allow uh, traffic that, uh, that comes from pods with label role equals auditor. Now, there is another piece to this puzzle that is a Cilium Identity, CRD, custom resource. This custom resource allows Cilium to associate labels with integer identity values. These integer identity values facilitate efficient policy lookup in the BPF programs. In this example, the identity value of one, two, three, four, five is associated with the label role equals teller. Uh, generation and management of identities for host processes uh, can be a talk of its own uh, because it's a complex topic. It's uh, highly subjective and there is no one right way to assign identities to host processes or processes. It can vary from one use case to another and uh, 
But however, I have to discuss this briefly here, specific to my our use case, in order to give better context for the rest of this talk. So what happens with our use case? We use a unique ID for like kind processes. Uh, what do I mean by that? Let's see. Uh, one example is all Kubernetes API servers in a cluster would carry the same identity, say one, two, three. And all kubelets in a, in a single cluster would bear the identity, say four, five, six. All Jaeger agent instances across multiple clusters could bear the same identity value of seven, eight, nine, but you may choose to do it on a per cluster basis. You see what I mean? So the common constraint though is that uh, in this setup with uh, encapsulation, we have to live with the 24-bit identity, 24-bit number that, the, that can go into the VNI field of the Genio or VXLAN headers. This does give us 16.7 uh, million unique application identities, which is sufficient for our purpose. But if for some reason that becomes a limitation, Geneve has this capability of options that can be used to allow carrying identities, the identity values that are greater than 24 bits. So the real crux of the problem is that host processes do not have labels that can be mapped to an identity, nor do they belong to a distinct network namespace that can be associated with an identity. So the, the million dollar question is, how do we identify traffic coming from host processes in the kernel and assign the network identity to the, assign the network identity to such traffic? I'm, I'm going to digress a bit here to talk about the original idea that is responsible for solving this problem here today. Uh, this is not my first barbecue. The idea dates back to a couple of years ago. At 2022 KubeCon in Detroit, I presented a use case of quickly resizing a particular pod that is increasing its memory allocation when that pod issued a make command to build code, which is a CPU and memory intensive task. On that instance, I used an eBPF program to identify when the specific container that I was interested in ran the make command by looking up the cgroup ID of the container task. For that, I used the BPF helper function, BPF get current cgroup ID in the, in the context of the exec system call. This allowed me to look up the cgroup ID. Knowing the cgroup ID allowed me to tell between my container running the make command versus other containers or other processes on the node running the same make command. This allowed me to trigger an in-place pod resize for my container only when my container issued the make command. That idea was well received. So why is this relevant? Guess what? The answer again lies in C group ID. Now, we wave that eBPF magic wand once again, only this time we do it in Cilium network traffic data path. It starts, it starts with the host process sending a packet. In the kernel, it shows up as a socket buffer structure or SKB. We use the BPF helper function, BPF SKB C group ID to look up the C group ID of the sending host process. We then use that C group ID to look up the 24-bit host process identity from the host process net ID BPF map, which is pre-configured by the control plane. We then insert this 24-bit identity value into the VNI field, the virtual network identifier field in the Geneva or VXLAN header and transmit the encapsulated packet. The last step to this is at the receiver, we look up the ingress network policy to determine if the sender is allowed or denied to talk to the target. And then we make an allow drop decision on the incoming traffic. Now let's understand the demo setup, our demo setup. Uh, continuing on this theme of the banking business for this demo, we have a simple two node cluster here. There, is, uh, the, there are nodes, the master and a node named node one. On node one, we have the bank database pod. And on the master, we have three pods, the bank teller pod, the bank auditor pod, and a thief. The, the bank teller needs to be able to talk to the bank database pod in order to do operations such as account, credit, debit. And the bank auditor pod also needs to be able to access the bank database pod. In addition, it needs access to the host network for monitoring. The thief is a bad actor who has social engineered their way into getting host network access. 
Cilium and other CNI solutions have been great at enforcing network policies for regular pods, aka the bank teller pod and the bank database pod, but not the auditor or the thief pods until now. In this demo, we will see how we can allow the bank teller and the bank auditor to access the bank database while keeping the thief out. I have a video recording of this demo. Uh, the smart thing to do is to just play this video. But let's have some fun. Let's do this demo live. <laughs> The video can be plan B. I'm going to apologize if it's too small for people in the back. Uh, I've done, done my best to expand this up. Let's start by looking at some pod specs. I have three pod specs, th three pod spec files, YAML files that we want to look at, uh, the bank teller, auditor, and thief, and then a policy file. We'll look at these uh, as we go along. First, let's look at uh, the bank teller pod. So this file contains a spec for two pods, the bank teller, which has label role equals teller. We schedule this on the master node. And the bank DB pod, which has label role equals database, we schedule it on node one. Let's create this. It's been created. Now let's look at the auditor pod. This has label role equals auditor, and we schedule it schedule it on the master node. It has host network equals to true, which means it uses the host network namespace. Let's create this pod. And lastly, let's look at the thief. The thief is also scheduled on the master node, and it has host network equals to true, which means it's using the host network, network namespace. All right, let's verify that the pods are up and running. We have our two node cluster here with the master node bearing the IP address 105.10. Let's look at the pods. As you can see, the bank auditor and the thief pod have the IP address 192.168.105.10, which is the IP of the master node. That's because they're using the host network. And the bank teller and bank DB pods are using, are, uh, managed by Cilium, so Cilium assigns these IP addresses 0041 and 101141. Now, without any policies in place, all pods can talk to all other pods. In this, in this demo, in this test, we will try to ping the bank database pod from the other three pods. Before I do that, let's watch the traffic that's coming in and going out of the bank DB pod. For that, I'm gonna fire up this T, uh, TCP dump Wireshark uh, with filtering on the ping packets, which is ICMP as a filter, and the IP address of the bank DB pod, which is 10.01.141. Let's restart the capture. All right, now, now the fun starts. Let's first, let's first ping from the teller pod. With this command, I'm executing into the bank teller, and I'm looking up the IP address of the bank database pod and uh, sending a ping to it, one ping only. As you can see, the ping was successful. The ICMP ping echo request went out and it got a reply back from the, from the bank DB pod. The source address is that of the bank teller and the destination address is of the bank DB. We look at this field here, the VNI, Virtual Network Identifier field. It has a ID value of, it has a value of 11638. Where does that come from? For that, let's look at the Cilium endpoints. CEP is my alias for getting the Cilium endpoints. And it shows it manages two ports, the teller and the DB port. And the identity ID value for the teller is 11638. That's what goes on the wire. That's what Cilium puts on the wire. Now, let's ping from the auditor. So I do the same thing. I exec into the bank auditor port and send a ping. The ping is successful. If you look here, it's using IP address of 10.0.0.36. Where does that come from? Well, it is the IP address of the Cilium host interface. 
Selenium host interface is what Selenium uses to route traffic that's uh, for host network pods. And it has a ID, a, a local, it's, this is the local host ID, a generic value of six. Let's try the thief. The thief is also able to ping. It's using the same source address as the, as the auditor, and it has the same network identity as the auditor. So at the database pod, we cannot tell the difference between the teller and the thief, uh, the auditor and the thief, excuse me. Now let's, we need some policies here that would stop the thief from being able to talk to the, talk to the database. Let's look at what that might be. So this YAML file specifies a simple Cilium network policy that says, apply this to pods with label role equals database, and the action to take is allow incoming traffic from pods, from pods with label role equals teller or role equals auditor. Let's create this policy. And let's verify. CNP is my alias for getting the Cilium network policies. And uh, we can see it's got a creation timestamp UID, so it looks legit. And uh, the spec is what we expect. Now let's do our ping test again. These are our nodes, these are the pods, they're still running, good. Now let's clear the clutter over here and let's try pinging from the thief. The thief cannot ping anymore. As you can see, the echo request went out, but no response. So the thief has been stopped. Let's verify that it works for the teller. So we exec into the teller, and the bank teller is able to ping, so it's working for the teller. And then let's try the auditor. The auditor cannot ping. Why? Let's look at the source ID of the thief and the source ID of the auditor. They are the same. They have the same identifier, so you cannot distinguish between the teller, the auditor, and the thief. So we need some eBPF magic here. Thankfully, I have a script that, just does, that does just that. So this little script, do eBPF magic 34567, uh, what it tells, it, what it does is it takes this value of 34567 and assigns this as an identity, as a network identity for the bank auditor pod. Let's run the script. What it did is it looked up the container ID of the bank auditor and then uh, it found the C group ID for that container ID, which is this value here, 16347, and associated the ID value that I passed in, 34567, with that. It created a Cilium identity object for that, and then it entered this value. Uh, this is BPF tool hex, pardon me, but it, the, it, trust me that this is C group ID mapping to the network identity value. And now that we have this in place, let's try the bank auditor ping again. So this time, the ping worked. And if we look closely, what's changed? The ID, the network identifier of 34567 is now going on the wire for the bank auditor pod. Let's verify that the thief is not letting through, let, has been let through as well. So let's ping from the thief. Nope, the thief is still locked out. The auditor can reach the database, but the thief cannot. And just to make sure that I didn't break the bank teller, let's ping from the teller one more time. And the teller can ping. So that, with that, we were able to allow the bank teller and the bank auditor to talk to the bank DB pod while keeping the thief out. That, my friends, is the magic of eBPF for you. Thank you. <laughs> These VMs could crash any time. <laughs>
All right, um, uh, let's have a quick poll. Uh, can you guess uh, how much code I had to write in the network traffic data path in order to figure out the identity of the of the process that is sending the packet? Uh, can I get a please? Can I please get a show of hands? How many people think it's more than a hundred lines of code? No, no one. Okay, a few. How many people think it's more than ten, less than hundred? Okay. You're all very smart. How many people for less than 10? That's the only choice left. <laughs> or there are a few people who's, I don't know, okay. Well, let's take a look. This is what it took, that's it. <laughs> the fact that it is so ridiculously simple to make this happen speaks volumes about the maturity of uh, Cilium for this purpose. Now, now let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Uh, as we saw, identity-based policy enforcement for host processes is, uh, is quite cool, but we cannot go home just yet. Now think about it. What happens if the container jailbreaks and acquires the capability, BPF capability on the host? It can manipulate the maps, and then we may be in trouble. Uh, so we still need a defense in depth strategy that's grounded in zero trust principles. And uh, to that end, uh, we have been using the Trust Fabric solution within eBay for a couple of years. And uh, it, it evolved for uh, the last five, six years. It started around the time Spiffy and Spire started. Uh, it's been working well at eBay scale, and uh, it's kept us legally compliant with the payment card industry, PCI regulations, uh, the security requirements that they, they ask for. Uh, in terms of, uh, at the core of it, it uh, this solution leverages uh, JSON web tokens, JOTs. And in terms of performance, it does over 36 million token generations and out of 4 billion token validations each day. We're working to open source this code. I'm pushing for that. And uh, I, I hope to present uh, in a f at a future conference, if we get the chance, uh, present our segmentation solution that uh, combines layer 7 trust fabric policies with uh, layer 4 Cilium network policies. Now, so to summarize, Securing apps at scale, it is a challenging problem, and we need to have an efficient way to enforce policies. Uh, fortunately, eBPF continues to shine and show its power in this space. Uh, we broke new ground here today in extending layer four identity-based segmentation to host processes. Uh, of course, uh, we plan to contribute this feature to upstream Cilium. Uh, we have a bunch of issues to resolve, a con cases to figure out. Uh, after we are done with that, we should be able to get there. Uh, the bottom line is that we need layers of security, or what's called as a defense in depth strategy. Uh, zero trust architecture, this is, this is where the industry is headed, and with this, we are aligning ourselves in that direction. And uh, with that, I will conclude this session. Uh, thanks a lot for attending, but before you go, I have one request. Please scan, please scan this QR code. It will take you to a place where you can leave feedback for me. Please let me know what you found useful or what I could have done better. I love to hear back from you and uh, I, read, uh, I look at the feedback and I try to act on it. Uh, so please, please visit that link, leave feedback. Thank you. And <laughs> thank you. Uh, I can take some questions now. Uh, we, looks like we have some time for that. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, the question I have is the tech seems to work because you have this magic.sh. How yeah. does it work in practice to like, make this production ready? Um, the, in practice, what we would need to do is there are two parts to it. So it breaks down to the identity, configuration of the identity. So one of the things I covered, uh, touched upon there is that Cilium identity object. So we need to create that. And that's the part where uh, the control plane plumbing comes in. And uh, we, would, we looked at it closely, looked at our application space and how do we do that. That's where we were, we were trying to figure out what's a good way to figure out the identity values given that we have so many uh, applications, we have uh, X number of applications and uh, the number of instances. So an application like you know Kubernetes API server, you could have five instances in a typical cluster that has uh, like a production cluster. Uh, now you take that to some other uh, applications, how do we, map the identities. That is the uh, harder part of the problem that we want to solve. And the control plane interface, that's what we're trying to define, uh, which will be very generic. The, uh, the, 
the question about uh, what this script does, it assumes that part is plumbed in. So, if you notice that I passed that argument value at 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, this script is essentially taking that and it's like pretending that this whole control plane plumbing has come in. That's going to be a lot of code. Uh, in the data path, uh, we need to, this is one particular case. So, this is a communication that's happening cross node. So, we are talking from a host process, host network pod that's on the master to node 1. Uh, we also need to resolve cases like what if the host processes are on the same node? What if a host process is talking to like kubelet? Uh, a kubelet is talking to a pod. That is allowed by, poly by default because health checks run uh, in, that, uh, in that. So we, should in we need to ensure that we don't break it by doing this. So there are these several corner cases that we need to resolve. Um, it's not a whole lot of work. Uh, we, it's, it's about prioritizing and bandwidth, so uh, you may imagine how things change a bit here and there <laughs> in terms of priorities. This was, this was not a, a very high priority project to begin with. It's, it was like, okay, you just joined eBay. Here is this fun project for you to do to get warmed up. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it was. Uh, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Couple of questions. Uh, sure. The second one is literally related to the first one. In order to inject the identity into the VNI, I assume that you have to build your eBPF uh, on the on the host, right? Yes, it is done by uh, an eBPF program. Uh, okay. What if in a production environment you are not allowed to build anything? So this is. Uh, are you talking about um, permissions? Yeah, the, uh, having the, the capability to build a BPF program, injecting yeah. the identity for that particular pod or host process, yeah. and attach it to the, uh, to the program itself. Attaching, of course, uh, must be allowed, but probably build the BPF not. Yeah, this would, what this would look like is this would be a, a, an extension of a, a new feature in Cilium, which already has the BPF capabilities. So Cilium agent can, it has uh, uh, full access to the system because it's a core infra component, which means it has BPF, uh, sys capability BPF. It, it's allowed to attach, detach BPF programs and do a bunch of additional things that it needs to do as a system, a critical system daemon. Uh, now, the part about how do you specify identity for a host process, that can be as simple as an annotation on the host process. Let's say you want to, uh, specify, in this case we have a host network pod, the bank teller, there could be an annotation which what I did, the do eBPF magic, do eBPF magic script, instead of that, in the bank teller pod you set an annotation that says uh, the my network identity is 34567. So that is typically how the control plane would uh, look at it and, and implement it. Uh, I didn't do it in this case because this was easier to show. Uh, that's kind of a little bit hidden, it's behind the scenes. I did that in the demo a couple of years ago using annotation, using a, a pod annotations where I specified the resources. It wasn't as readily seen. This is a lot easier to see. So for demo purposes, this is what you do. But yeah, to, I hope it answers your question. Uh, that's one way to do it. That's not the only way, but typically we, you know, we make liberal use of annotations. It's a very convenient comf uh, feature that's there in CM. You ha this would be one of those uh, when uh, in production environments, the identity would be looked up by various uh, parameters. Okay, this is an application. What namespace is it running in? Na application namespaces are typically use, uh, unique. And then you could have the cluster that varies. It could be a staging test cluster or a dev cluster or a production cluster, and they would have different identities. So that would be something, uh, some kind of an admission control hook would inject based on, it, it would look up uh, some kind of a central database and then uh, inject that ID into that so that the application developer doesn't have to specify that. So that mapping has to happen. So the control plane part of the work is significant. Uh, and really, if you think about it, we, Cilium just needs to provide interfaces to make this happen because our control plane, how we do it, may be very different from how you do it or other, a third company would do it. So we cannot, you know, become opinionated on that part. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, after reading the um, description, I had an impression that uh, the talk wouldn't be focused on host network containers, but 
not uh, host network containers, but on host processes? Oh, it's the same, it's the same thing. So uh, I believe in the abstract, I did write both uh, host, network, host network pods as well as uh, host processes. Mm -hmm. This can be applied to host processes as well. So the caveat with that is that it would apply to the long running host processes. The difference is uh, we're looking at the C group ID. In the case of uh, the, when you create a pod, the container D or the cryo, there, your uh, container runtime creates the C group, uh, C group for that pod. In the, case of, uh, in the case of host processes, like an example would be the Kube API server or Kubelet, the C group ID is created by system D. So if you look in the in the BPF map paths, you will find uh, you'll see where it looks up systemd dot slice. In that under that you'll find all the host processes that are running. Now, if it's a very short-lived host process, that is one which is which we cannot. I don't know if we have super fast way of figuring out the control plane and then plumbing it. It could still happen, but that's some that's a case that I've not really considered. Uh, what we really were looking at is the use case here is. Uh, Kubernetes API server in cluster A should only be able to talk to Kubernetes uh, kubelets in cluster A yeah, yeah, and not yeah. cluster B. So, so thanks for the reply, but my question is what if I got introduced to some vulnerability after an, a node update, like through our, my package repository, so I would like to set up, like centralized setup uh, firewall to our host process outside of Kubernetes. Right now we're using Ansible for that. And yeah. It would be nice to have like networking policy and like actually describing the uh, firewall at the nodes. This, yeah, this doesn't preclude or prevent uh, Netscope kind of uh, uh, a firewall in uh, from being there. This doesn't, uh, uh, it can continue to work. So the, that is the idea of defense and depth strategy, right? You have multiple layers of security. Yeah. You, uh, you kind of assume that uh, a motivated uh, attacker or a hacker will find a way to get into your network. So you can't just say, okay, I just I have my VPN, I'm all set. They could break into that and then do havoc. Of course, of course. What you need to do is limit the blast radius. And but what would be your advice to group all uh, CG groups inside Kubernetes for, uh, and distinct them from all CG groups like in system DN outside of Kubernetes? There is no difference. It's a kernel, it's a kernel construct. C groups is a kernel construct. Every single process gets, uh, gets its... Uh, yeah, but how to know, like, because there's like random ideas, how to distinguish them in real time? Oh, by using the BPF uh, SKB yeah. C group ID, uh, yeah. that function call. The, the, that is the easy part. The hard part is when that lookup happens, does the map entry, is that configured? So that configuration can be done easily for long running processes, which is which we want. One, as pods, are, pods have a life cycle. There's gonna be like a pre-start and there's a bunch of things that happens. Mm. You can hook it to one of these and do it for pods. And uh, system D processes like Kubelet, API, uh, Kube API server, a uh, Kube API server is really a pod, but system D is a Kubelet service. Uh, Kubelet is a system D service. There is a, there is a system D file that goes along with it and system D is responsible for its uh, running, runningness or its health, uh, keeping it alive. And those kind of processes, uh, the C group ID is created by system D. It's managed by system D. And uh, you can reliably look them up. Mm, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we are out of time, but I'm happy to, uh, I think there's another talk after this, so I'll uh, step away from here and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be around here in case you have more questions.